Maneuver Warfare. Here you can see a depiction of an Assyrian siege engine, uh, specifically a battering ram. It basically is a wheeled vehicle. It's got six wheels. Uh, at the front it's got a little tower and there's a prong that's reaching out and pulling bricks off of a wall of a city. And this is dated from a, uh, a uh, carving from 870 uh, BC. It's effectively the first armored vehicle. These vehicles were very often uh, given the names of horses or mules. This is the device that is the Trojan horse. So we have this uh, Bronze Age collapse memory by Homer of this giant horse and the, the, the uh, Greeks jumped inside the horse and the Trojans pulled it inside their encampment and then they were able to pop out at night and open up the gates. But this is the real vehicle. Uh, the Greeks were using some sort of a, a copied Assyrian battering ram, and that story evolved. Now, the, the uh, Assyrian battering ram has four to six people, and it's, it's actually the size of a, of a, of a small truck. Um, you certainly couldn't put 20 people inside it, so you have to keep this, uh, the image here um, in context. And uh, most of the walls of the cities uh, were made because they were in the floodplains of Iraq uh, in Mesopotamia there wasn't a lot of stone and so most of the walls were built out of mud brick and so you, you could have a device that would pull the bricks off of the wall so you know it's interesting to see that some of these myths have a basis in truth but um, that truth is often a much smaller scale than the fantastical legends that we get so let's return to a comparison between maneuver and methodical battle. If you recall, uh, Auftragstaktik and Befelstaktik can be compared across, across a spectrum of variables. And we already covered these in a previous lecture, so I'm not gonna go into it again, but this is just to highlight what those differences are. In the interwar period, meaning after the First World War and before the Second World War, the major combatants of the First World War did an assessment to examine how they should change how they would conduct warfare. The First World War was traumatic and resulted in enormous losses, but by the end of the First World War, most of the powers had learned how to resume mobility on the battlefield. German General von Siecht did a deep study of German performance in the offense and the defense in the First World War. And the Germans identified tanks as a way of maintaining the momentum of the operation. However, the Germans made no fundamental change to how war was conducted in the very last year of the First World War. The British, when focusing on tanks, conceived of them as fast-moving cavalry with the mission of breaking through the front line into the enemy rear and rapidly exploiting. This is an idea that was shared with the Germans. British writers like J.F.C. Fuller and Little Hart wrote about this as a part of their indirect approach. The French focused on tanks to enable the defense. The French paid an enormous price in lives in the First World War, and so the French built the Maginot Line as a large defensive work on their border with Germany, and they focused on tanks being distributed in small numbers to all the different infantry units. So rather than concentrating the tank forces, they had them dispersed to provide firepower in the defense so that each infantry unit would be able to deal on its own with an enemy tank threat. Now the Germans chose an all arms capable force built around the tank and the infantry with the support of the aircraft and artillery. And the key piece of technology here is not the tank with its internal combustion engine, which is often what we associate with the Second World War. It was the radio which coordinated the tank, the infantry, the artillery, and aircraft. So if there is a piece of technology that defines the Second World War, it is the radio which facilitated decentralized infiltration tactics and the combined arms operation that was required to make it a success. The Germans distributed radios to every single armored vehicle and to every infantry and artillery subunit. Some, some French tanks had no radios. 
uh, some uh, Soviet tanks had no radios. And you'd have essentially one tank with a radio and you'd have the rest of the platoon following the leader who'd be using flags to communicate. So the French and the English and the Russians were behind the Germans in their ability to conduct coordination. Now we frequently hear the term Blitzkrieg, lightning war, which is the German way of fighting war. And it basically captures the alarm of these fast moving German vehicles that were uh, able to defeat Holland and Belgium and France so quickly and able to penetrate into the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa uh, in 1941. However, it is not a German term and it's not a doctrine and it's not a, it's not a term that was ever used by the German military. Uh, it was created by Italian journalists in 1942 and then picked up by the American journalists in that year as America was entering the war in Europe. The Germans would have called their form of warfare combined arms operations. Exactly that. They would not have called it Blitzkrieg. So this image we have of the tank being decisive is not true. It was never decisive. Tanks are very vulnerable on their own outside of a combined arms operation. Here you can see a British tank in the First World War bogged down in the mud because it lacked engineering support. In fact, the largest tank battle between India and Pakistan at Asal Uttur in 1965, the Pakistanis lost most of their M48 patent tanks in exactly this way, getting stuck in the very difficult muddy terrain of the irrigation works in the Punjab. I had a Lynx when I was in the military. It was an armored tracked command and reconnaissance vehicle. This is how I got around. And it was me, my driver, and my assistant gunner. And I took it once to an impact zone uh, in Valcarche. Valcarche is a Canadian forces base north of Quebec City. Uh, an impact zone is a part of a military base that's basically rubble because people have been using it to fire artillery, artillery rounds at. And one of the consequences is that you get uh, uh, strawberry and raspberry bushes there because these are it's a kind of plant that grows in rough ground. So naturally I deployed uh, into uh, the impact zone in order to collect some strawberries and raspberries. And uh, in that difficult terrain, I slipped on a rock knocking the track off of my armored vehicle. And I was there with a mallet uh, for an hour moving the vehicle back an inch and forward an inch to try to get the teeth of the track back into the, um, the wheel uh, ridge. It was a, 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 an elegant demonstration of the vulnerability of these very heavy armored vehicles. They're, they're not invincible. They're, they're actually very vulnerable. If someone were to sneak up behind an armored vehicle with a sledgehammer, you could knock the track off and then the vehicle has lost its mobility and it takes a long time to get those tracks back on. So we can think of a combined arms operation as that rock, paper, scissors kind of game where uh, the paper can surround rock, rock can break scissors, but scissors can cut paper. In some ways, artillery uh, can destroy a tank. Uh, some artillery, like the British 25-pounder gun, can also fire anti-tank rounds. Now, if you're firing at infantry, you're firing a high explosive round with shrapnel. If you're firing against a tank, you want um, a, a round which with a very hard head made of tungsten that's going to knock its way through the armor. Or a high explosive anti-tank round which bursts through the armor using a plasma jet. So artillery, is, it's easier to hide than a tank. You can stick it in the bushes in a building behind a berm and it'll probably see the tank before the tank sees it. Infantry, on the other hand, is probably stronger than artillery because they can sneak up to the artillery unit in a dispersed fashion and then shoot at the artillerists who are not well protected. So um, tanks are not always the strongest and it depends what the tactical situation is, what the terrain is, what the level of the density of the force is. Different combat arms have advantages over others. So what you want to do is take the characteristics of these different weapons and combine them into combined operations teams. So a tank has got a lot of firepower. It's a heavy vehicle, it's got a big gun, it can carry machine guns, and carry a lot of ammunition. And as long as you've got flat ground and roads, they move fairly quickly. But they don't see well. They don't see infantry very well, and they don't see anti-tank weapons very well. Um, artillery, however, is... is um, not as mobile as tanks, they don't move as quickly. Um, 
they, however, can bring a lot of suppressive fire, which means they can bring artillery rounds down and smoke that'll conceal movement, that'll disrupt infantry advances. So when artillery comes down, the infantry, they jump to ground. Because if you're standing up, you're more vulnerable to shrapnel. Uh, artillery uh, typically won't destroy a tank unless they get a direct hit, but a near hit will take off a track, or it'll, it'll damage the machine guns, or it'll knock off the radio uh, aerial, making it difficult for the tank to communicate. Uh, artillery itself is very vulnerable, but it's responsive. I mean, you call them uh, in 20 seconds that are going to aim their battery in the right direction, and then 30 seconds later, rounds are going to start coming down. Infantry are incredible. They're like, like rats. They can go anywhere, move anywhere, infiltrate anywhere. They're incredibly silent. They sneak around. Um, and if they get close to you, I mean, if they get on top of your tank, you're doomed. If they get right near your artillery, you're doomed. And they have very good observation skills. They can find stuff. So uh, a, a tank alone is very vulnerable. The British, uh, in their war in North Africa during, during the Second World War against the Germans, uh, they took their all cavalry, all tank force, and they would charge it against German positions at, at fairly high speed. The Germans deployed an anti-aircraft gun called an 88 millimeter. And it, this, this artillery piece meant for shooting down aircraft is very vulnerable. It's exposed. Um, but the British didn't have infantry with them. They didn't have air support. They didn't have uh, artillery. And so these 88 millimeter guns would destroy large numbers of British tank formations with relative ease. If the British had brought a mortar or a small artillery piece or infantry, they could have easily destroyed the German anti-tank guns, but they didn't. The combined arms operation is what gives these military instruments their power. It's not the size of the gun on the tank. Here on the bottom left, you can see Russian infantry supporting Russian T-34 tanks. And on the bottom right, you can see US Marines operating with a Sherman tank in a jungle environment uh, during the Pacific War against the Japanese. Here you can see a painting of a Soviet tank attack. And you can see uh, the Soviets uh, liked to deploy their tanks in tight formations. But other vehicles that are less easy to see, and I'll, you know, I'll take up my pointer here to sort of point them out. The Soviets were heavily into combined arms operations. This is a BMP. It carries infantry and it'll debus at some point. This is a piece of mobile artillery that provides uh, local support. Uh, this is a PT-76 reconnaissance vehicle, uh, which can go across rivers. And so this collects information for the rest of the formation. Uh, here we've got two different kinds of tanks. The T-62 is older and the T-72 um, is more modern with a more powerful gun. Um, and so, and here you've got some uh, MI-24 Hind helicopters that provide support. And so here we have infantry, artillery, reconnaissance elements, different kinds of tanks. This here is the type of uh, Soviet artillery support at different ranges. You've got the M46 gun. You would have recognized this earlier when we looked at Chinese weapons. Here's a multiple rocket launcher. It fires a lot of rounds inaccurately. Um, and here is a medium artillery unit and a light artillery unit. And this light artillery unit is actually amphibious, so it's convenient to cross the various rivers in West Germany if the Soviets were to attack. This is the uh, type of force that NATO would have used to stop the Soviets. So here we have a British Challenger tank. We have a soldier with a Dragoon anti-tank missile. We have an A-10 aircraft. We've got a drone, and this is going way back in the 1980s. I mean, in fact, we've had naval drones and bomber drones going back to the 1950s. Drone technology is not new. The drones are simply getting a lot smarter than they used to be. Here's an Apache helicopter. Uh, here is a tornado aircraft uh, dropping a bomblets that would submunitions that would damage the tank. And here in the center we have the Soviet tank that is the uh, victim of all this. And you can see here coming off from the edge of the map is a copperhead um, uh, shell fired by a piece of artillery 15 kilometers to the rear. So here we see uh, uh, Israeli armored doctrine of 1967. The Israeli uh, tank general Tal argued that combined arms was for Europe and was not relevant 
for the Israeli experience because you're looking at open deserts. They're relatively flat. There's not a lot of place to hide. So the Israelis uh, neglected their infantry. And in 1967, this belief was confirmed because the Israeli armor advanced very quickly across the Sinai against the Egyptians defeating them. What you can see here is the Mitla Pass. The Mitla Pass um, is here on the map. And I drove to the Mitla Pass when I was in Egypt. It's actually a restricted area, but I told the taxi driver I wanted to see the birds. But what you get to is a valley with, with this colored sand, but because it's volcanic, you've got black mounds on both sides. And the Israeli paratroopers landed here under um, Sharon in both 1956 and 67, and they basically destroyed the Egyptian forces that were retreating through the Sinai. Uh, for the most part, the Israelis did very well in 1967 because the Egyptians retreated and the Egyptian retreat broke into a rout, which means a, a disorganized withdrawal. And the Israelis chased them all the way up to the Suez Canal, uh, which is uh, here to the west of the Sinai. Uh, now, this led to a very wrong inference on the part of the Israelis, which is they don't need infantry and they can use all armored forces in the same way that the British did. So in 1973, six years later, the Egyptians conducted a counterattack. They basically did a surprise attack across the Suez Canal into the Sinai against the Israeli Barlev Line, which is a series of forts along the, uh, the Suez Canal. The Israelis conducted an immediate counterattack in October of 1973, and they lost 15% of their entire armored force in about 12 hours. And the, Israeli, the Israelis went into panic mode. They uh, armed their uh, nuclear weapons and they went to the US um, uh, uh, requesting reinforcements uh, for their tank forces. And they publicly stated that, that uh, warfare had completely changed. Tanks were now obsolete because the Egyptians had used anti-tank rockets, specifically a Soviet Sagar rocket that could be fired by an infantier from a trench and destroyed large numbers of Israeli tanks. But in fact, that's not what happened. What happened was the Israelis learned the wrong lesson from 1967. Because the Egyptians had routed and fled in a disorganized fashion, the Israelis imagined that an all-tank force was sufficient in modern warfare. In fact, it was not. What the Israelis had failed to do was use combined arms operations. They had deployed tanks without infantry. So after a few days, the professional force of Israeli airborne soldiers, these are not conscripts, they're, not vol they're, they're volunteers, long-term service professionals, they, in combination with the Hassanai Brigade, which was an armored unit of, of commandos, uh, and highly trained Israeli professionals together did combined arms operations and were able to conduct a counter offensive against the Egyptians. So it's basically a lesson that combined arms operations is difficult, but it's always vital and it has universal applications. And when you don't have combined arms, you have fairly pre uh, predictable outcomes in terms of large scale damage to armored forces. Uh, you can see uh, a destroyed, uh, rather a wrecked Israeli M48 tank, and you can see the Egyptian infantry, in this case not operating a Sagar, but operating an RPG-7 uh, anti-tank rocket. So it's these kinds of Egyptian soldiers hidden, um, uh, because the Israelis did not have accompanying infantry or artillery, uh, that were able to disable the Israeli tanks as they drove by, because they, they couldn't see very clearly where the Egyptian uh, infantry was hiding. Um, so it became you know, very quickly apparent uh, for the Israelis that it was important for them to update their uh, doctrine, which they did. And they then used um, uh, artillery coordination, which they hadn't done uh, in 1956 or 1967 uh, to the same extent. Uh, Israel suffered the same problem in 2006 when they fought Hezbollah on the Lebanese border, which is they deployed all tank forces with conscript infantry who had not been trained in combined arms operations and Hezbollah was able to destroy Israeli tanks that were isolated because the Israeli tanks and Merkravas were not getting the help from the infantry to identify the targets. 
So the Germans relied on decentralized combat resource pull combat doctrine. The Germans believed that the fog of war, which is you know the constant not knowing of where the enemy is and the confusion that accompanies that, and friction, which if you recall are all the little things that sort of pile up to deviate plans, created an environment where you had fleeting opportunities uh, for exploitation and that these were beyond the possibility of central control. So this necessitated a directive type of order called the Aftrage that provided the outlines of the commander's intent, which is called the Absicht. And it left the execution to the lowest command level. This technique of command and control was called Aftragstaktik. It required the lower German commander to be aware of operation goals two levels up. So if you're commanding 10 soldiers, you need to know what the mission is, not only for the platoon of 30 soldiers, but for the entire company of 120 soldiers. And that therefore, the lower commander, knowing the intent of the overall commander, uh, would have to change how they conducted the mission. How, essentially, how they conducted the mission was up to the junior officer. Now, historically, Anglo-American and Russian forces have relied on centralized and coordinated battle plans, which the Germans call Bethelstaktik. This sacrifices low echelon initiative and the exploitation of fleeting opportunities. The Anglo-American argument is that synchronization is easier to achieve with this form of tight command and control, while the Russians believed that mass and tempo, meaning large numbers of concentrated soldiers and high speed operations can compensate for the lack of flexibility. So instead of being flexible, the Russians and the Soviets would simply hurl large numbers of soldiers at a location and they would uh, ensure that the operation didn't end. It just kept pushing deeper and deeper into the uh, enemy rear. So in effect, Bethel's tactic is command push. You have a plan at a headquarters and they direct the different units to move in a particular direction. Whereas Uftrug's tactic is recon pull. In other words, the offensive is led by junior leaders at the front doing reconnaissance, finding opportunities, calling back and saying, follow me. The Bundeswehr, which is the uh, West German army during the Cold War and, and now the name of the German army post-Cold War, uh, they call the same doctrine Inere Furum. Here you can see a picture of a Leopard II main battle tank. The Germans designed their armored vehicles for high mobility uh, because you have a choice. I mean, if the armor is, is uh, too thick, the vehicle is slow. If the gun is too light, uh, it gives you more speed, but doesn't give you penetrating power. So the Germans chose to reduce their armor and maintain a powerful gun and high speed. Because uh, 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 even West Germany and Germany today continued the German tradition of focusing on the offensive, aggressive use of tanks uh, in high mobility uh, recon pull operations. This is the 1991 Operation Desert Storm by the US and its allies against Iraq, which had invaded uh, Kuwait in 1990. A lot of armor was involved, and along the 73 Easting, you had a major encounter between US armor and the Republican Guard of Iraq, which is equipped with a T-72 tank. And the Iraqis did very poorly in those engagements. We imagine this to be some sort of blitzkrieg operation, but it wasn't. The British and the French, Americans and their Saudi and Egyptian and Syrian allies who did the invading coordinated their operation according to a timetable. Armored units moved through strict corridors and following specific assembly area and uh, uh, objective timelines. There was an instance where a British unit left its zone for a brief period and it got bombed by the American Air Force and it was a significant loss of life. And this happened more than once. So although this was a heavy armored operation, it was not Aftragstaktik. It was a timetable operation, completely choreographed like a ballet with no flexibility. If the Iraqis had acted in an unimaginative way, there was not enough time to change this plan. So uh, tanks don't define what kind of operation it is. Uh, how flexible the plan is defines what kind of operation it is.
So the goal in maneuver warfare was to break into the enemy's decision-making cycle and thereby to concentrate forces against that weak point. And this is captured by Boyd's repeated decision-making action cycle that we looked at earlier. The fact that you've got an observation step followed by orientation, then decision, and then action. Here you can see the British headquarters staff. And headquarters staffs in NATO trained to make decisions much more quickly than the Soviets. Remember, the Soviets are using tempo. So the Soviets have a drill system where they would advance very quickly and they would give an order and then the entire formation would then change their formation to continue to move. So they could be on a road, get an order to move off the road and attack a target. And they would all move at, at, in a one giant block using combined arms operations, but the entire organization would move in one giant block. NATO, on the other hand, had much more flexible operations. Their units would be broken down into subunits where one unit would move while the other one provided cover fire. That's a much more efficient way of providing protection. Um, and so it was a big question whether the Soviet mass advance uh, would do better or worse than NATO's fire and movement and rapid decision-making system. Uh, I personally think that NATO's system would have been significantly superior. If you look at events like the uh, Soviet intervention in Chechnya or the Soviet in intervention in Czechoslovakia in 1968, uh, that type of mass tempo movement will fail dramatically if they encounter a flank attack that was unexpected because they don't have the drill to respond. And by the time they do respond, the NATO unit would have pulled out and gone somewhere else to do another counterattack. So the result would be three desired effects from maneuver warfare. One, preemption of the enemy effort. So you would inflict damage on the enemy when they are most vulnerable during the preparation phase. So while the enemy is planning an attack and getting organized and getting fuel and beginning their operation, you hit them. In this instance, you're sacrificing security for surprise. So rather than having your force in one dense element, you're having it uh, break down and rapidly attack the enemy uh, in smaller groups to dislocate them. Number two, functional dislocation. You basically lure the enemy out of a favorable position by attacking them, causing them consternation and to panic, and then to deploy in a suboptimal way. By hitting an enemy in unexpected uh, fashions, you confuse their command structure. Number three, disruption. You attack the enemy's center of gravity, where they're the weakest. Here you can see a picture of a British uh, Challenger main battle tank. This British design was actually quite slow. It had a very powerful gun, just like the German Leopard 2, um, but the British supported heavy armor. So the British logic was you'd use combined arms in a set-piece battle, and you'd encounter the Soviets by drawing them into large open killing zones, like fields that you see behind this armored vehicle, and you would destroy them in large numbers. And the Challenger tank was an instrument in this philosophy of combat. So the British were not for attacking, they were for having set-piece uh, uh, defensive operations, which nonetheless were maneuver warfare, because the British would need to predict where the Soviets were going to show up and then appear before. Now, B.H. Lytle Hart wrote uh, in the interwar period about the indirect approach. And here he emphasized uh, three elements. One, avoid the enemy's strength by inhibiting the application of their strength basically by not being where they are when they're strong. Two, deceiving the enemy to avoid their main strength. And three, creating and exploiting the enemy's vulnerability. Here you can see a British infantry on an exercise. So on the basis of these observations, the Germans became accepting a failure, which was caused by boldness. In other words, aggressive attack but were intolerant of failure, which was the result of caution or indecision in their training of officers. Conducting decentralized operations requires far more training than fighting methodical type battles, because soldiers need to be taught judgment through repetition and coordination without long preparation time. It was also necessary to train soldiers to identify the Schwerpunkt, literally the heavy point. 
And while it originally meant the point at which you broke through the enemy line, it could also refer to the friendly unit that was the focus of the support. The Schwerpunkt must be accompanied by diversionary thrusts that would distract enemy reserves. And in principle, it must be redirectable to one of the alternate thrusts if required. The center of gravity of the enemy is not their source of strength, but rather their critical vulnerability. Destruction of the enemy's center of gravity must not result merely in a reduction of their capabilities, but rather a paralysis of their forces. And so this is the objective of maneuver warfare. It's not simply destruction, but to disrupt the headquarters' ability to give orders and to control its own forces. You can see here a breakthrough, which could be interpreted as a Schwerpunkt, uh, and you see some uh, anti-tank equipped uh, soldiers. So this is a picture of the armored breakthrough. First you need to find the gap, then you break in, then you break through the gap, and then you break out of the gap. And you can see some of the vehicles that were organized for this purpose by NATO. You've got a West German Leopard 2 main battle tank, a US M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicle in the middle. You've got a US F-15 e Eagle strike aircraft. And on the uh, bottom right, you've got a US 155 millimeter M109 Paladin self-propelled artillery piece. Now, Stephen Biddle, who taught at the U.S. Army War College and worked at the Institute of Defense Analysis, which is basically the think tank for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Pentagon, the military leaders of the uh, Pentagon, uh, wrote a book called Military Power in which he did a mathematical analysis as well as a statistical and case study analysis of variables that demonstrated when breakthroughs succeeded or failed. And uh, Biddle identified four variables that are essentially a geometric analysis of the disposition of the forces at the point of the breakthrough. So let's take a look at those four variables. His first proposition is that the narrower the point of breakthrough, the higher the local force ratio. So in other words, if you're attacking not on a broad front, but on a very narrow front, you can put a lot of your forces against a very small number of the enemy forces on the defense line. However, he qualifies, the more restricted the area for maneuver, the harder are the logistics and the more vulnerable it is to counterattack. So sometimes you do want a broad front because you need a base to protect your, sol your, your forces, your soldiers, your tanks as they do the breakthrough. If it's too narrow, it could be cut off and isolated and this is dangerous. Here you can see infantry debussing from an armored personnel carrier. So frontage therefore has an internal optimum. You don't want to have a frontage that's too narrow. You don't want it too wide. You want it just right somewhere in the medium area. And it depends on the terrain and the number of soldiers. So this is a variable uh, and, and this varies according to many other factors although it's, it, there's, there's no systematic model to show you what controls it, but you could intuitively think that you're going to need a larger frontage if the terrain is very wide open and there's no safe place for your armored vehicles. So let's take a look at the second proposition. Biddle asserts that the faster the tempo or the speed of the attack, the higher the chance of breakthrough and the higher probability that the attacker will avoid the defender's counterattack because there simply isn't enough time for the defender to organize themselves. However, the increased losses will occur as the tempo or the speed of the operation increases because there is less time for exposure reducing tactics like fire and movement. So when you make the breaking through the priority, you're not being as careful in your deployments as the attacker. So the trade-off is you're gonna suffer early losses because you're gonna have a relatively aggressive 
and almost reckless advance. But if you win, you're going to reduce your over loss, overall losses to the enemy. Here you can see a picture of an anti-tank team. So here again, you have an internal op optimum, which is you don't want to attack too slowly, but not too quickly. It's somewhere in the middle. And you can determine this empirically. The third variable is uh, the defense in depth. Now, defense in depth reduces the concentration of force by reducing mass, but it does this by exchanging territory. So you have a defense in depth, and it gives up terrain to the attacker. Uh, but the attacker loses momentum as they hit repeated defense lines in the interior. So it buys time, it disorients, and it reduces the efficiency of the offensive. Uh, here you can see uh, Russian soldiers with rifles and anti-tank rifles uh, during the Battle of Kursk in the Second World War and you can see a British warrior infantry fighting vehicle which is a modern uh, vehicle that carries British soldiers. So the defense against maneuver warfare uh, has a variety of different possible configurations. You've got your static defense. This is a point defense where you've got a number of fortifications up front. You've got your forward defense, where your soldiers are in a line at the point where the enemy is located. The third is defense in depth, where uh, you've got high manpower requirements. Uh, you're willing to lose territory. And this is actually very good against uh, breakthrough operations, because the, the breakthrough operation never does break through. It just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. But because it's a defense in depth, they never have a chance to break into the rear. The problem, of course, is with the defense in depth is that its front line defense is weaker than a forward deployed army because you have a lot of soldiers deployed in the rear. And the final type of defense is the mobile defense. This is where you predict where the enemy is going to be and you move your forces there very quickly. It requires very good intelligence and it's not always uh, feasible. Uh, uh, you, need, you need sophisticated and experienced commanders to predict where someone's going to go. Now, there are three methods of attack. There's the methodical battle that we've seen already. There's maneuver battle, where you're trying to do a breakthrough. And then there's the limited aims, which is a shallow attack. Here, you're not trying to conquer everything. You just want to capture a small piece of territory. And th this means you're not going um, uh, deep. You're just going for shallow. And so you're only interested in what, how many enemy troops there are in that one shallow target. Uh, here, you can see a Canadian Leopard 1 tank during the Cold War deployed in Germany. So here is the intersection between the, the attrition or, or methodical battle, the blitzkrieg or the maneuver uh, operation, and the limited gains versus the static, the forward, the in-depth, and the mobile. And if we were to look at uh, uh, these very quickly from uh, left to right, so let's start with static. If you have attrition against static, you're basically going to move in to inflict losses, you're going to advance up to these static positions, and um, the engagement will occur. If you have Blitzkrieg against static or maneuver warfare, you're going to try to get around these static positions, and it'll be quite easy to get around. If you're doing limited gains, well, you're going to go up against the static position, and it's going to be actually pretty difficult because the static position is located most likely on top of your objective. Let's take a look now at forward. If you have an attrition attack against forward, it's pretty, going to be pretty much like the static. You're going to move right up to the enemy and then engage them. Blitzkrieg, uh, however, can take advantage of forward. Because forward is so close up, if Blitzkrieg can concentrate in the location, make a gap and get into the rear, they've won. Now, for limited gains, it's a similar problem to uh, static, which is that they engage the enemy immediately at the objective they're trying to capture. And so uh, a forward deployment is pretty effective against limited gains because the, all the territory limited gains wants is occupied by that static line. Now let's take a look at in-depth. Attrition is going to do reasonably well against an in-depth position because they're going to encounter uh, a relatively poorly defended front because most of the troops will be distributed in the rear. In-depth is optimal for dealing with blitzkrieg operations because it's going to absorb the momentum and slow it down and disorient it and then the blitzkrieg is going to get stuck with a salient going deep inside the, the in-depth defense but they're going to be vulnerable to a counterattack. Uh, 
Limited Gains uh, is able to win against In Depth because In Depth is uh, got a low uh, a low number of troops at the front because they're widely dispersed, and so the Limited Gains is going to be able to capture their territory and then hold it against counterattacks. So let's take a look at mobile. If you had a good mobile defense against attrition, you could outmaneuver it and do a flank attack. Against Blitzkrieg, you could try to figure out where the Blitzkrieg is going to appear and then attack it in what's called a media engagement. That's where two sides are moving quickly along infrastructure and then they encounter each other. Against limited gains, um, a, a mobile defense is able to react and then get to the location in time to stop any advantage. So that's a rough comparison of, of, a, of a three types of attacks and four types of defense. So let's take a look uh, at advantages and disadvantages and some examples of the four defensive strategies. So a static defense relies on fixed defensive positions around key positions within friendly territory, like fortifications. Uh, you can see here Fort Douaumont at Verdun uh, in 1916. So the advantage is it's very hard to defeat directly. Um, and the disadvantage is that it's very easy to bypass and it encourages limited gains attacks because you can attack some areas where the static defense or the fortifications are not located. The Russians used static defense in 1941, the Soviet Union. Uh, Joseph Stalin forward deployed the army and this was disastrous. The German mobile forces were able to bypass the Soviet forces, uh, cut off their supplies and take large numbers of prisoners in the initial months of the invasion. Uh, the Soviet Union barely held on, but they lost, lost huge numbers of soldiers, equipment, and territory. Uh, here you can see uh, German infantry and a German Mark III Panzer tank. Then you've got forward defense. Here you've got maximum strength forward, and it's generally easy to bypass. So the advantage is that it deploys maximum strength for deterring limited gains attacks. So a limited gains attack that wants to capture just a small piece of territory like Kashmir or Crimea or Taiwan. Uh, if all your forces deployed there, well, they're going to have to defeat that force. There's no, there's no way around it to get control of the territory. The disadvantage is that, again, it's very easy to bypass because once you get through the front line, the rear area is completely undefended. Here you can see an American MLRS, Multiple Launch Rocket System. And some of these rockets can be boosted, um, so they can go up to 200 kilometers, and they have submunitions. So this is a, a very sophisticated rocket system that the Americans have been operating since the 1980s. Classic example of this is the German push through France in May of 1940. The English and French had a thin line, uh, and when the war started in 1940, they advanced through Belgium. But the line was still thin, and the Germans punched a hole through the Ardennes forest at the key junction of uh, Sedan and Mezières, and they were able to get into the rear, and the French and British armies in Belgium completely collapsed, abandoning their equipment, surrendering hundreds of thousands of soldiers, and the British evacuated 350,000 soldiers from Dunkirk. The third uh, defense is the uh, defense in depth. Here you've got multiple layers, and it slows the penetrating attacks of maneuver warfare, uh, but it is unconcentrated. So the advantages are you have very good, at, at, it's very good at slowing down fast moving, deeply penetrating attackers, typical of maneuver warfare and blitzkrieg. The disadvantage is that it leaves a state vulnerable to a limited attack because the strength of the defense is not concentrated. Uh, here you can see a uh, high mobility uh, French troops. Uh, a classic example of this was the defense at Kursk, which we spoke about earlier uh, in 1943. Here you can see on the right the German tanks, uh, on the left German tanks moving across. On the left you can see how far the Germans penetrated uh, into the salient. And ultimately they were unable to penetrate because of the uh, defense in depth. They suffered huge levels of attrition. The Germans called this Operation uh, Zitatel or Citadel, and it was ultimately uh, a big failure. The fourth technique is mobile defense, and it's highly mobile, and its intent is to block the enemy, but it requires very good intelligence to figure out where the enemy is. The advantage is that it permits blocking and counterattacking of the enemy. The disadvantage is it's very hard to show up at the right place and the right time without brilliant intelligence. Here you can see uh, U.S. infantry.
the West Germans relied on this type of deployment during the Cold War. But in the map here, you, these are the clustering areas of the West German, French, American, British, Belgian, and Dutch forces in West Germany. The West German doctrine in the 1980s was not to allow East Germany and the Soviet Union to overrun its territory, but to aggressively counterattack through constant flanking attacks of the advancing uh, uh, echelons of Soviet forces. And the, the Germans would do this by decentralizing uh, their armored forces, allowing the local commanders to aggressively pursue opportunities to attack the Soviets from the flank. Now, the internal optimum for the defense in depth, again, uh, it goes between shallow and deep, and it depends on the terrain. Um, I mean, there are some historical events uh, like the uh, breakout from Normandy in which the Germans did, were, did not have a sufficient defense in depth, um, uh, given the fact that northern France had flat terrain. And so different kinds of terrains are going to warrant different levels of depth. At uh, the Battle of Kursk, Operation Citadel, it was relatively flat terrain. So that defense in depth was 100 kilometers deep, which is fairly incredible. Uh, the Russians had huge resources, but it was necessary because the terrain was very, very flat. There were no mountains and uh, not a lot of deep woods. So the fourth variable is the reserve size. Reserves, and these are soldiers held back, they permit counter-concentration by unengaged, unpinned, fast units. And the logic is once you have units engaged in combat, it's actually very difficult to extract them. Uh, in fact, the military goes through very complicated drills of withdrawal. Because when you know, if you were to get up out of your trench and pull back, then the enemy sees you're pulling back, they're going to uh, attack right away to push against you, especially after you've left your defensive position. So doing a withdrawal or a retreat is very difficult. You've got to leave groups back and hold positions while everyone else is moving away very quickly, and then they have to peel back under cover in a sort of a fire and movement kind of maneuver. Um, mostly they'd like to just move back quickly and surprise the enemy and disappear before they're caught, but that's normally difficult when the enemy's in contact with you. So reserves solve that problem. They're basically available to be deployed. Uh, um, and so uh, it's much faster than pulling soldiers out of the line and moving them somewhere else. So the larger the reserves, the fewer the forward defenders for counter-concentration, and thus the faster the tempo of the breakthrough. Right? So if you have too many reserves, then you're going to weaken your overall defense. However, the greater force available for counter-concentration against the vulnerable penetration um, makes victory more likely. So if you have a big reserve, well, you can try to blunt the attack. Counterattacks are usually more uh, cost-effective than direct attacks. So when one side starts the attack, uh, it, it has the attack fairly well planned. It hits the defensive position. But then as it penetrates past the defensive position, it goes into unfamiliar territory, becomes disorganized, uh, loses tempo, slows down. It's got vulnerable flanks. Now the counterattack, which is done by the defender, they know the terrain. They probably rehearsed the counterattack on the terrain, and so their attack is going to be more effective because they know the terrain. There's no surprises, and they've, they've practiced it, where you can't practice an attack on someone else's terrain. So counterattacks are more cost-effective and more efficient than direct attacks. However, the later the counterattack, so if you wait and wait and wait before you deploy the counterattack, the longer are the flanks of the penetration, and the smaller is the enemy's uncommitted reserve. In other words, if you conduct a counterattack, they won't be able to counter counterattack you, and you're attacking against a column that is getting uh, less and less well defended because it's becoming bigger. Now, of course, a bigger column means there's more troops, but uh, at the latter stages of, of a penetration, you have more confusion, more disorganization, uh, a slower moving column, and therefore, a counterattack might be able to inflict more damage. Everything else um, uh, considered equal. So again, here you've got the internal optimum of the counterattack between early and late. And it re again, it really depends on the terrain and the type of equipment available. Uh, in Biddle's book, he looks at these mathematically. He's got specific case studies. And he does a game theoretic analysis. So it's a very sophisticated, multi-method approach. It's actually a very good book.
uh, you you know you should read the book if you're interested in, in, in getting more details on, on how to determine these internal optimums. So there are two offensive philosophies. The first one is to drive deep, to penetrate the enemy line and then to go very, very deep uh, to a city or to the deep logistics or to a headquarters. This was professed by uh, Heinz Guderian, uh, who you can see on the left, and J.F.C. Fuller, who you can see on the right, who's a, who's a British writer. Their argument was that the focus was to dislocate the enemy psychologically and uh, to penetrate. However, uh, in general, this dislocation argument has been found to be um, uh, exaggerated. It generally only works against very unprepared enemies. Uh, Israel uh, applied this technique against Egypt in 1956 and in 1967. And the deeper the Israelis drove into the Sinai, the more confused the Egyptians got, and their army eventually collapsed as they were withdrawing, seeking for cover. So uh, uh, e Egypt, on the other hand, could have held their ground, done flank attacks against the Israelis, and possibly inflicted logistical damage, meaning the Israelis would have had no supplies and would have had to slow down. But instead, the Egyptians withdrew and withdrew, trying to reestablish a line against the Israelis, even though the Israelis were behind the Egyptians and moving more quickly. This worked in France in 1940. The Germans uh, broke behind the French and English armies in Belgium and caused them to collapse. And here the Germans drove very deeply. It worked against the Soviet Union in 1941. The Germans drove very deep, bypassing huge numbers of Soviets, going for the logistics. This generally only works against uh, enemies that are very unprepared and are psychologically prone to panicking. Uh, the second uh, type of breakthrough is the drive and roll up the enemy flank. So here you're not driving deep. You basically drive past the enemy's front line, and then you go behind the front line where they're very vulnerable because the guns, the entrenchments are aimed the wrong way, the artillery is aimed the wrong way, you've got the food and fuel and munition dumps there. So you choose this when you're attacking enemies that are hardened and will not surrender when they're surrounded. Alfred Thayer Mahan, in his book, uh, Lessons of War with Spain, says, quote, force does not exist for mobility, but mobility for force. It is of no use to get there first unless, when the enemy arrives, you have the most men, the greater force." Close quote. So here you can see an example, sort of a shallow type of attack. So this is a chart of advance rates. So you have the campaign on the left, you've got the distance in kilometers that was covered during the campaign, the number of days it took, and the distance divided by days gives you the advanced rate in days, so how far you went in a particular day. One of the fastest offensives was the Megiddo campaign uh, in 1918. Uh, British General Allenby defeated the Turks and the uh, German allies that were deployed protecting uh, Palestine and Syria. And uh, even though Allenby had um, uh, camel forces and horse forces, most of his army were infantry. They were marching. They did not have any tanks. They had a few trucks. They had a few armored cars. Uh, a fair number of wagons pulled by horse, but most of that army walked. And uh, if you look at the chart, which is in the center, Megiddo 1918, it's right in the center, you're going to see that they were advancing 56 kilometers a day. So what does this tell us? Um, well, in terms of the velocity of military units, they, they only achieve about 10% of their maximum speed because the speed at which soldiers advance isn't the mechanical speed of a vehicle. You could have an army all in sports cars, and they still wouldn't go quickly, because the army needs to have fire and movement, where one group will advance while the other group um, uh, stays put and covers them with fire. And when the first group finishes moving, then the second group moves. And there are encounters with enemy forces, where you then have to maneuver even more slowly in order to get into position to attack. So you can't judge how fast you're going to go by the speed of the vehicles. When we talk about a tank having a speed of 60 or 70 kilometers an hour, that is a speed for the tank to jump from cover to cover while it's protecting its fellow tanks. It's not the actual speed at which it's going to be advancing down the road in the attack. Now there are some countries that do focus on the speed of the tank for strategic purposes. That was the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Their goal was to take as many tanks as they could because they, remember they they were going to compensate 
uh, uh, against NATO by having mass and tempo, moving a lot of tanks really fast. And so they were going to go down that road at 40 kilometers an hour, and they were never going to stop. When they hit a bridge, they had very fast engineering equipment. They were going to cross over and they just keep going. Now, an example of this in uh, application was Syria's attack on Israel in 1973 in the Golan. The Syrians took Soviet... Uh, tactics where they took a large number of tanks and moved them very quickly down a road. They didn't stop them so they could fire more accurately. They just had them fire while they were driving. And they did push the Israelis back, but they did it at enormous losses. And when the Israelis counterattacked, much of the Israeli armor had already been destroyed. So the terrain has a lot to do with uh, the kind of cover available and how fast soldiers advanced. And so Megiddo uh, you're looking at 56 kilometers a day. People were walking because they were able to outflank the enemy, which caused the Turkish army to collapse. So this is an incredibly uh, fast advance rate. Uh, you look at Manchuria in 1945. Uh, there the, the, you have the Soviet army that's experienced against the Germans. The Germans are defeated, and the Soviets move their army across the Trans-Siberian Railway to the Far East to do battle against the Japanese. And there they advanced 50 kilometers a day. They completely broke through the Japanese lines. The Japanese were not prepared for the um, scale of the violence that the Russians unleashed. And these are you know, four or five year veterans uh, against the uh, Nazi German invasion. And the Israelis in the Sinai, 1967, 55 kilometers a day. They were basically just driving down the highways through El Arish, down the Sinai, all the way to the Swiss Canal, as fast as they could go, ignoring what was behind them. Here you can see a rates of advance and breakthrough operations, and it shows you Megiddo, for example, on the very top. You've got the width of the front. You've got the depth of penetration, how far they advanced, how long it took them to break through. Because you've got the battle at the front line and you're looking for gaps and you want to fight your way through. So here it's really a conventional methodical battle at the first stage to get that gap. And then it's got the advance rate in kilometers per day after that. And you see again, Megiddo is very fast. The other fast time is if you look down, you've got Sinai Rafa in 1967. So achieving a breakthrough is important if you think that this type of maneuver warfare and penetration into the enemy's rear is the key to victory. Here you've got the uh, rates of advance versus force ratios. So you're going to calculate how, uh, well, you've got the personnel strength ratio, the force strength ratio. The force strength ratio is calculated from the Dupuy attrition model that you've already seen. And you can work out the uh, combat power ratio. And sort of quite predictably, uh, there is a rough relationship that the higher the combat power ratio is in the favor of the attacker, the faster the advance rate is going to be per day. So uh, it does matter how much power you can bring, um, not necessarily the number of personnel, but the power, which is skilled personnel times uh, equipment available. So in the top chart, you've got the mean advance rates for selected campaigns by era. And so you're looking at Napoleonic, American Civil War, World War I, World War II, and post-World War II. There's a general increase in the rate of advance, but it's not enormous. It's not even doubled. So the difference between walking and in post-World War II, you're looking at helicopters and fast-moving uh, trucks, number of personnel carriers. It's not much faster than walking because those very, very fast vehicles, even helicopters, need to be able to deploy troops in a fashion that allows them to move. So helicopters can't fly anywhere. Uh, they're vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire from covered locations like jungles. So even their um, movement um, is limited by the terrain's cover. So the rates of advance by campaign duration. And here you've got uh, how long the campaign lasted in days, how many of them um, fit into that. So it, it's, you've got here the, the, um, the average days, the average distance, and the average rate of advance. So um, operations that last zero to five days have the fastest advance. Um, and it shows that most of, the, most of those advance rates are either in World War I or post-World War II. So it's probably focusing on the Israeli operations in the Six-Day War. Um, and the Six-Day War, of course, was six days long. It was quite short. So criticisms of maneuver warfare. Well, maneuver warfare is very risky. And it fails as often as it is tried. Most war-initiating offensives are successful 
because of the surprise opportunity afforded the aggressor. But it's quickly uh, learned about by the enemy and it becomes counterable by attrition strategies. Uh, you can see on the right a map of Operation Mars. Here the Soviets did a very large-scale offensive operation into German territory and the Germans were more, more, more mobile simply maneuvered around the penetration and then cut it off and then starved it and destroyed it. So it was a catastrophic defeat for the Soviets. Uh, the Germans were experienced in mobile warfare. The Soviets were less experienced. So it, it, it's not advisable to try to penetrate an enemy uh, who's more mobile than yourself. And they've got better leadership and better training to deal with that. Uh, at the beginning of the Second World War, uh, 1939, Germany attacked Poland and very quickly defeated it using maneuver warfare. And then the Germans applied the same techniques against Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France and very quickly defeated it and Denmark and Norway. But after uh, those series of, of catastrophic Allied defeats, the British learned how to fight. And in the Western Desert, uh, the British were much more able to absorb that kind of shock. The British, in other words, weren't uh, prone to panic when the Germans uh, infiltrated deep into their rear. Uh, they actually counterattacked from their position. And the Germans uh, suffered some uh, failures uh, in their operations against the English. Now, seeking to win without attrition fighting may produce, in fact, a more dangerous outcome than fighting. Maneuver operations quickly wear out as others adapt to learn against them. So if we take a look at cases, right, and the cases are, the criteria is that there was an attempt to break into the rear and they got as far as the breakthrough segment, right? So we're excluding tactical infiltration. People are just trying to get into an area to fight. We're talking about bypassing an area to get into an enemy's rear. So I mean, there's a selection effect, which is we're excluding canceled attempts or pre-breakthrough failures. And so we're, we're really creating cases here that um, they're, they're, they're uh, conservative estimates because we're excluding cases where the operation was canceled or never even happened because it failed. So let's take a look at these failures. We have, of course, June 22nd to July 10th, 1941, uh, Barbarossa, where the Germans attacked the Soviet Union. Germany failed. Hitler thought he could get to Moscow and Kiev and uh, Leningrad and break the Soviet Union, but he didn't. The momentum was lost. And despite the huge losses to Soviet military forces and the losses of territories and key industrial areas, the Soviets held on by applying defense and death, by fighting ferociously, and um, uh, when the conditions were difficult, such as when it was winter and muddy, the Russians effectively counterattacked uh, the Germans and put the Germans on the defensive. In January, February of 1942, uh, you have the Russian counteroffensive um, uh, in which Germany prevails. That's Operation Mars, it was a big disaster for the, uh, for the Soviet forces. So it was a failure. The Russians should not have attempted maneuver warfare. They should have stuck to attrition. August 31st to September 7th, 1942, at the Battle of Alam Halfa, the British conducted an offensive, uh, a, a deep penetration offensive, and the Germans prevailed. The British probably just should have closed with the enemy and gone for methodical battle and not tried to outmaneuver the Germans. January 22nd to May of 1944, Anzio. Uh, during the uh, Anglo-American and Canadian campaign in Italy, the Americans and the British conducted an amphibious operation just south of Rome at a place called Anzio. You can see th the map at the bottom and the pictures of the Allies landing. It was meant to put large numbers of Allies behind the German defense line on the Italian peninsula and to cause the German line to collapse. It failed. The Germans very quickly isolated the beachhead and they trapped the Allied, Allied forces there for several months. Uh, at one point, it was called the largest self-sustaining prison camp in Europe because the Allies that were there were stuck there. They had difficulty pushing out against the Germans holding uh, against them because there are mountains on the outlying areas of Anzio that gave the Germans a significant advantage. So this attempt at doing a maneuver operation by amphibious operations and landing in the enemy rear failed completely. September 17th to 26th, 1944, you have Operation Market Garden, where the British landed uh, a series of paratrooper uh, units along with the American 101st and 82nd in order to uh, 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 capture a road leading over uh, 
the Rhine, and th this would have allowed the British and Americans to get through Holland into Germany without being blocked by that large river. Uh, there's a very good movie. Uh, most mo war movies are, are fairly horrible because they don't show the violence or they don't show the true history uh, or they get the tactics completely wrong or the weapons wrong. But the uh, movie Bridge Too Far is a very uh, accurate, uh, fair uh, representation of what happened. It's a very long movie, but it shows an attempt at maneuver warfare that ended catastrophically. December uh, 1944 to January 1945, the Ardennes Offensive, uh, Germany deployed 120,000 soldiers, 600,000 tanks, and 1,600 aircraft um, against uh, 62,000 Americans with 730 tanks. And the Americans won. They absorbed the German offensive out of the Ardennes, the same force that the Germans attacked France in, in 1940, and the German offensive collapsed. Um, these are large-scale operations, and they all ended in failure. They're uh, 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 gambles uh, that inflicted uh, ultimately more losses on the enemy, uh, on the attacker. And the attacker, if they had chosen a methodical battle, they would have been better off and they would have um, suffered less casualties and inflicted more losses on the enemy. So we still have the persistence of the methodical battle. Critics argue that the major victories of the Second World War, such as Al Alamein, uh, where the British defeated the uh, Germans in the desert, and many of the Soviet offensive, like um, Op Bagration, which destroyed Army Group Center, the German army on the uh, the, the plain opposite uh, Moscow. These were uh, these were methodical operations and not maneuver operations. They were biased towards exploiting firepower synergies rather than seeking opportunities. Uh, Mon field, British uh, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery's operation at Al Alamein, which was the the turn of the tide in the Desert War um, in North Africa during the Second World War. Uh, he moved very slowly, very methodically. You had, you had the engineers and the armor and the infantry supported by artillery. It was just a meat grinder. They made contact with the Italians and the Germans and basically destroyed them and eventually uh, created a hole. And then the Germans and Italians withdrew and the British did not pursue aggressively. They pursued fairly slowly across the desert, consolidating every gain so that they would never ever have to um, uh, retreat again. And th the advance went from Al Alamein, which is near Alexandria in Egypt, right across Egypt into Libya, right across Libya into Tunisia. So we're talking several thousands of kilometers of slowly following the retreating Germans. So this view argues that maneuver warfare was successful in France and Belgium and Holland and Yugoslavia and Greece and the initial stage of the Soviet Union but that it was the doctrine of the methodical battle that succeeded thereafter. Soviet and German attempts to use maneuver warfare, such as the Ardennes Offensive, failed. The methodical battle permitted Allied victory over Germany in North Africa, Italy, and France. So I mean, this leaves, leaves us with a question about maneuver warfare in the future. I mean, we have what's called the revolution in military affairs, which has been an observation that the revolution in communications technology perhaps uh, is going to lead to another major change in how wars are going to be fought. You know, you've got quantum computing, right, which is, um, it uses the characteristics of, of quanta uh, and um, uh, you can, the number of computations you can make in a computer is enormously high or higher than it is with a conventional um, a, a binary computer. So uh, quantum computing can do things like target resolution, look past camouflage, um, uh, do calculations of, of the probability of impact given a target at a distance and weather and wind. You've got quantum entanglement communications where uh, you, could, you could have uh, one subatomic particle um, split into two and they behave symmetrically and um, it's difficult to intercept that communications and you can use this uh, communication to control uh, various other assets. You've got machine learning uh, which can help which can operate within quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing would be the hardware and machine learning would be the software and it's, it would be a way of analyzing problems. You could have distributed networked drones, basically a, a software where different bodies work together. Maybe one tank with several unmanned tanks or an aircraft with several unmanned flying drones. So the question remains, despite all this advance in technology, should the technology that's in the military but designed for bottom-up recon pull or top-down command push. So we're still left with the question,
despite the technology, how should uh, soldiers think about the most efficient way of achieving victory? Is it going to be by the methodical battle or the maneuver battle? 